Right, we have a lot in store for you, but first let's take a look at the highlights. And what about the victims? Lawyer of post election violence victims appeals against any move to defer President Uhuru's trial. Behind bars, suspects arrested in Italy for organized crime. And in business, we talk money matters as Equity Bank releases its quarter three results. Well, let's begin the bulletin this afternoon at the Nairobi Center for International Arbitration, which has been launched. The center is expected to offer an alternative to the court process in the resolution of international as well as domestic commercial disputes. The center, which will be chaired by Arthur Igeria, has eight members, including the Attorney General and nominees from the Law Society of Kenya, the Kenya National Chamber of Commerce, the Kenya Private Sector Alliance, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators of Kenya, Uganda and Rwanda chapters, and the Office of the Chief Registrar of the High Court. This is a center that was created under the Nairobi Center for International Act. And uh, it is, its main mandate would be to resolve dispute uh, through alternative means, that is through uh, mediation, uh, adjudication, and arbitration. And um, this is the first of its kind in Nairobi, first of its kind in Kenya. And we are intending to be a regional center for dispute resolution mechanisms uh, in, uh, in Africa. We, we wish to be the preferred seat for arbitration in Africa. Uh, there are other centers like this uh, in the world. There's one in Kuala Lumpur. There's a center in Cairo. There is a permanent court of arbitration. There's a London court of international arbitration. So in, in, in many ways, more than one Kenya has been uh, in the forefront uh, of uh, with regards to the many uh, commercial transactions currently being carried out in Kenya. It is best that we have a center like this that will promote the resolution of the system. Still in the justice system, the case beating former chief registrar of the judiciary, Gladys Cholet, and her former employer, the Judicial Service Commission, has now been moved to the industrial court. The JSC served Cholet over allegations of impropriety and insubordination, uh, on, uh, on after which she moved to court to challenge the decision. Now, the case has now been moved to the industrial court as it involves a contract between an employer and an employee. Cholet has maintained her innocence and has instead accused the Judicial Service Commission of being biased against her and conducting shoddy investigations. The JSC on its part has since written to the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission to probe Cholet further. Cholet was sacked on October the 18th following a two-month saga that involved leaked emails in a battle that has continued to put the judiciary in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. To Isili, where 37 suspects arrested in Majengo Sunday night in a raid by police have been arraigned in court this morning. The suspects have been charged for being involved in organized crime in Isili by extorting cash from pedestrians. The 37 have been remanded in custody pending their identification by the prosecution since majority of them do not have proper, uh, proper identification cards or even documents. Now, police have intensified raids in several estates in Nairobi, especially after the worst gate attack. <laughs> on television has made a comeback right here on KTN. Right, we're talking about the country's first ever weekly environmental feature that aired for the first time over 10 years ago. Every Sunday, Eco Journal will be taking a closer look at key environmental issues in the country and around the world. And with a key climate change summit due to open in Poland in just over a week, this first edition will focus on one of the most pressing environmental questions in the country, that is of forest. 
Garissa County has just over 7% forest cover, according to a recent finding, and the situation is getting worse. But one initiative in that county is now seeking to roll back the loss from the kitchen. Right, KTN's Richard Tinina up next with a, a preview of last night's episode of the uh, Eco Journal. <laughs> For kilometer upon kilometer, dry shrubs and bushes largely characterize the landscape in Garissa County. For many pastoral communities here, this is their idea of a forest. But even then, the few trees in this arid land are disappearing by the day. This is why. Trees and shrubs are being cut down to supply the flourishing charcoal and firewood market. Such scenes are common throughout the county. In Garissa County, 78% of the residents use firewood uh, and about 10% use charcoal. Indeed, the latest report published by the Kenya Water Towers Agency indicates that only 7.09% of Garissa County is covered by forest, slightly lower than the national average of 7.14%. And at this workshop in Shantabak in Garissa, a group is seeking to reduce the rate of deforestation in the county. The youth and not so youthful are joining hands in this workshop to make energy saving jikos or burjikos as they are known here. At one corner of the workshop, they prepare the pieces that will form the outer part of the jiko. At another end, cement is mixed with water. The mixture will in the very end form part of the technology that will help preserve the energy inside the jiko. With the components ready, the jiko slowly takes shape. A pre-prepared clay mold is fitted into the metal housing of the jiko, and the cement mixture is used to fill the space between the clay mold and the metal housing. It is a concerted effort as the jiko finally takes its shape. A few days later, the cement has dried up and the jiko is ready for use. The equipment and the material used are actually the ones that do not release the, 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 the energy as you use the, the, the JICO. The Burjiko project undertaken by the Shantabak Burjiko Youth Group is being implemented by Honeyed Africa through the support of the Embassy of Sweden and UK Aid under the Changieni Rasli Mali initiative. We're not providing the JIKOs, we are only teaching them how to do it. Once they do it, there are a lot of funds right now in the government, like the Ways of Hand and all other funds. And once they get that, they can now do an income generating activity by themselves. Why we are supporting communities to look for alternatives to fuel wood, that is charcoal and firewood, is to reduce that pressure now and uh, make sure that they can, they can begin to walk a journey where they are looking at their current and the future generations will have an opportunity to also benefit from the existing uh, uh, tree cover. The Shantabak Burjiko Youth Group is already looking to reach out to more residents to join hands in making the energy saving jikos. The alternative technologies, and especially for like uh, energy saving, come with other benefits because we are looking at there will be spin-off activities that bring enterprises for people to sell these technologies and alongside that comes with the opportunities for income for as many other especially the youth on the ground in garissa the burjikos are already making a difference in kitchens in shantabak at Abdul Ghani Ali's homestead, the shift from the old conventional to the new is evident. It has been three weeks since Ali abandoned the three stones and he says there is no looking back. At this hour, Ali is boiling some water. He says, aside from the time it now takes to cook, he can also work out how much firewood he needs in a day. That means less firewood and charcoal for many like Ali who have made the big switch to the energy saving jikos. Those who are already using the Buru Jikos will tell you that the new innovation has cut their charcoal and firewood use by more than half. 
and conservationists here will be banking on the energy saving jikos to help save the environment one homestead at a time. Rita Tinina, KTN, Shantabag in Garissa County. <music> We'll do make a date with Eco Journal next Sunday for the second edition of that feature. Now, the legal representatives of victims at the ICC in the case against President Uhuru Kenyatta has now written a letter to the President of the United Nations Security Council expressing opposition of the victims to any resolution by the Council to suspend the prosecution of that case. According to Fregal Gaynor, suspension of the case pursuant to Article 16 of the Statute of the International Criminal Court would set a bad precedent and would deny victims of the post-election violence the justice they desperately need. The appeal by the victim's lawyer comes in the midst of concerted efforts by a high-level delegation of the African Union Executive Council to lobby the UN Security Council to defer the cases. The African Union has asked the Security Council to take into account threats to peace or an act of aggression likely to transpire in the light of prevailing and continuing terrorist threats existing in the Horn of and Eastern Africa. In his letter, however, Fergal argues that if the Kenyatta trial is delayed until Kenyatta finishes his term of office in 2018, or if re-elected in 2023, there is a real risk that the interest of the victims will be totally extinguished. Letters to the UN Security Council by the Kenyan government and the African Union have both urged the council to defer the cases, citing terrorism-related concerns. Article 16 of the Rome Statute allows the Security Council to suspend an ongoing prosecution for a maximum of 12 months if the Security Council determines the existence of any threat to the peace, breach of peace, or act of aggression. An annual grant of immunity in this case will encourage Kenyatta to seek re-election in order to avoid a trial for as long as possible. It will also encourage other heads of state and government to hang on to power at all costs in order to avoid international prosecution. According to Fergal, it is unfair to require the thousands of victims in the Kenyatta case to wait longer for justice, saying that nearly six years have passed since the horrors of the post-election violence. The victims, many of whom are elderly, fear that they will die before they see justice. Fergal is also concerned that deferral of the trial until 2018 or 2023 carries serious risk of witness withdrawal given the trend that has been witnessed by the Office of the Chief Prosecutor that has seen unprecedented levels of anti-witness activity in the two Kenyan cases. The sovereignty, integrity, the victim's lawyer does not seem to agree that the constitutional requirements of a sitting president should be the basis for the deferral either. He says Kenyatta assumed office in full knowledge of his obligation to attend trial. And with these reasons, Fergal hopes to dash the hopes of the African Union and indeed President Uhuru Kenyatta to have his case at the ICC deferred. Linda Ogutu, KTN News Desk. Senate Speaker Ekwe Thuru has commended President Uhuru on his stance on the media bill, saying more consultation needed to be done before it is assented to. Speaking during the opening of the Second Africa Colloquium of Legal Council at the Parliament's building, a forum which brought together delegates from various countries to deliberate on emerging issues on parliamentary institutions, Ethuro cited that the media have a right to inform the public without fear or favor. I definitely support the position taken by the president and the deputy president that uh, and there's a provision in law it's not uh, it's not outside the uh, the way we make our uh, once a bill goes to the president for assent the president if he feels there are things that are, uh, are not good he will always bring it back to, to, to the house for further consideration and so i would be expecting the president not to sign that particular bill the former TJRC official Tom Ogenda has declared his interest in replacing outgoing Judicial Service Commissioner Ahmed Nasir Abdullahi, whose term at the powerful board ends in December. Professor Ogenda has been on a campaign to across major towns and law centers across the country and is seeking to represent lawyers' interests at the JSC. The commission has lately been in the limelight as internal wrangles exposed discord within its ranks.
us and I have support of lawyers from Eldoret, uh, Kitale, Kisumu, Kitui, Machakos, Mombasa, Malindi. And on Friday and Saturday, I, I met lawyers from Meru and Nyeri. I have a track record. Having served as president of Eastern Law Society, uh, Pan-African Lawyers Union, Chairman Law Society of Kenya, I've served in the International Bar Association. Right, a 50-year-old man has died in Maralal District Hospital after consuming illicit brew. The man is said to have taken the deadly brew early morning on his way to visit his ailing mother at the same hospital. Now, it is after the indulgence that he fell sick, prompting his friends to take him to hospital where he died on admission. When reacting to the incident, Samburu leaders blamed the government on being lenient on illegal brewers who put the lives of Kenyans on the line. The leaders say they intend to accelerate investigations and crackdowns on the brewing dens to reduce the deaths. Right, we need to take a short break, but a uh, story you do want to be following is on the standard media.co.ke. It's a story about a new team that has been set up to relook at the media bill before it is uh, taken back to the floor of the house. And that uh, body consists of journalists, media practitioners, uh, stakeholders, and whatnot. So that's a story you want to be following. Standardmedia.co.ke, that's the website once more. We now go into a short commercial break. When we come back, we have the results of equity quarter three right. and also a lot happening in the world of sports. Stay, Stay tuned. tuned. <laughs> right straight into business as, far, as always it's fast and painless but first before we get into the afternoon business chat we have some results for you equity bank has announced a 7.2 percent growth in the profit posting 12.6 billion shilling profit before the third quarter now this was low growth for the bank following massive capital expenditure during the period and the impact of reduced lending rates now during the period the bank saw deposits grow by 17 percent to 192 billion shillings while net loans stood at 158.5 billion shillings from that interest uh, income grew only by 4% to just about 23.5 billion shillings. Now, Equity Bank is in the process of upgrading its IT system to focus more on mobile and online banking and has so far invested 2 billion shillings in the upgrade. Now, the bank has also signed up with a number of merchant payment providers such as MasterCard, Visa and American Express as, a position, as it positions itself for increased trading opportunities in the African market. We're very, very excited that the fundamentals of the bank have also strengthened uh, significantly. Deposits this year, so far year on year, we have grown 17%. Uh, and if you compare uh, that with those who have published their results, uh, you can see we are growing nearly four times uh, faster uh, than the market. And again, we are very excited uh, that um, the delivery channels, uh, particularly uh, the agents of banking have been able to take banking to uh, the whole. Well, one of the strategies Equity Bank is incorporating is going cashless by partnering with MasterCard, uh, American Express, and Visa. And I'm joined in studio by a gentleman. This time around, he's holding a different title at MasterCard. Uh, but just paint the clearer picture of a cashless system in the Kenya. That is James Renaina from MasterCard Worldwide now. I understand it will be rebranded to just MasterCard. That's right. James, um, what is the opportunity, especially for people in the banking sector, of a cashless uh, economy, if you like? Okay, thank you very much, Pony. It's great right. to be here. Right. Um, we have, a, 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 at MasterCard, obviously, one of our key thrusts is mm -hmm. looking at a world beyond cash. Right. And uh, if you look at some of the very, I think, innovative uh, executions that we've put in the marketplace more recently, what we're trying to do is, is to help uh, facilitate uh, increase in commercial activity, especially right. at the retail level, mm -hmm. by facilitating payments and facilitating payments digitally. Right. Um, cash is expensive. It doesn't look that way, but mm -hmm. cash is expensive. Mm -hmm. How so? If you think, uh, if you're a bank and you need to think about how it is that you're going to put and avail cash at ATMs at branches, and you think around the dynamics of this of uh, deposits and withdrawals that are made at those points, uh, there's considerable cost. Right. There's the cost of delivering the cash there or right. repatriating it. There's the cost around security. Mm -hmm. um, there's 
the cost of, of handling it uh, as well, the cost of staffing people to do a very manual job. You can actually replace um, a lot of those transactions by just going cashless. Yeah. Um, so some of the more recent things I think you would have seen in the, in the media is, for instance, the launch of the, the Nakumat Global Card. Right. Essentially, what uh, our partner Nakumat has, is envisioning is providing a first-class customer experience where customers walk in and not only get the benefit of a loyalty program, but also get the benefit of paying electronically. Right. It saves up on queue times, and um, it, it also, through this particular proposition, because it's MasterCard branded, allows the customer not only to pay within a Manakumat environment, but to pay outside of one as well. James, this is a concept that is really swanky, if you yes, like. And yes. um, um, you're talking about Nakumat, uh, and um, right now, the people at the bottom of the pyramid have access to banks They're in yes. the banking sector. That's right. Banks have actually grown because of this part of population. Absolutely. What is there for them and how do you encourage them to get into a cashless system where they're used to handling money because of the Kadogo economy as it were? Absolutely. I think, I think that's an excellent point. This, this, it's a journey. I think is is the key thing. Ninety seven percent of transactions that are done in Kenya today are actually cash. Right. Um, the real reason for that is the average ticket size of transaction. Several studies have corroborated to show right. is less than a dollar. So what needs to happen is the digitization process needs to filter down, and that's a journey that that we are on. I right. think by first of all partnering. Uh, you know, if you think about the Nakumat proposition, <coughs> right. they are the largest merchant by value and by volume in Eastern Central Africa. So it's a great place to start right. by getting their customer base, which is very divergent, um, sort of into the electronic kind of payment space. But there are a whole lot of other initiatives that are happening. There's also you know banks are partnering with us to very aggressively roll out points of sale terminalization moving away from the uh, the traditional devices which would typically cost 700 800 dollars to devices such as mobile as point of sale right. there's a thrust towards e-commerce uh, as well facilitating online transactions and that's a whole untapped space so digitizing these transactions if you right. really think about it now creates um, new merchant categories it creates new opportunities for everyone, including the bottom of the pyramid. Right. James, my final question would be, how safe is this? Well, what are the security parameters put up uh, around uh, a cashless system like MasterCard? Well, let's take an excellent example of the Nakumat Global Card. It's EMV. Um, it's it's actually an EMV card right. um, already. That's the highest state of... Um, of but of, we're moving of to, 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 to chip or... or the, the e my, we're mag stripe, so exactly yeah. my point. This, right. is, this is chip enabled. Right. It's EMV enabled. So in terms of just the security features that have been incorporated within it to facilitate safe uh, electronic transactions, that is a, a gold standard. So what you'll find is with a lot of the initiatives that we're rolling out, initially the card is going to be the form factor. Um, it's going to be based on EMV. What that's going to do is going to bring a new level of confidence right. into the marketplace, um, acceptability by merchants, right. and obviously what that's going to do is, is, is drive the issuance play. So banks are going to find it easier to put a card in a customer hand, not only for use in this market, but also for use internationally. Right. So we're very excited to be at the thrust of actually driving that. All right. My director tells me we have to wind up this conversation here, and I have to follow that. So, Edith Sports?